at the beginning of uh, 2012, uh, I had a pretty secure job, was earning pretty decent money, and had a fairly uh, easy, uh, if unexciting, thank you, if unexciting life. Um, and then I came to this bloody place. <laughs> Um, so this was me at the two lectures in 2012. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about BeerBoz, which is uh, the business that I, I founded later that year. I'm going to talk to you about um, our story so far. I'm going to talk to you about what we do. Uh, as I've got a bit of time to ramble on a bit, I'm going to talk about what we really do. Um, and then most importantly, I'm going to talk to you uh, about why I do it, uh, or why we do it. Um, the story of Beer Bud starts with my old man. Um, he's known locally as Reggae Dave. Um, <laughs> you don't get a name like that without being a bit of a character. And his true passion in life is pigeon racing. <laughs> I can see a few people, particularly those from overseas, looking at each other. Is that a thing? <laughs> and uh, I used to go with uh, my old man every Friday night to a pub called the Coventry Arms. Uh, and the only reason I used to go to Pigeon Racing Club uh, was because it was where I could get a sip of his Banks's Mild. Um, anybody drank Banks's Mild before? Good stuff. Uh, it's a beer style that's almost extinct now, but if you don't want to get your children hooked on beer far too young, do not give them this as their first experience of it. Um, it's a smooth, sweet, malty, sort of flat Coca-Cola of the beer world. Um, Oh, God, I just love it. <laughs> Even now, it's really uncool. It's a really old man beer, but um, I still love it. Um, I've got some notes. You have to excuse me whilst I pull them out of my pocket. And then when I was about 14 years old, uh, my, um, my underage passion for drinking reached new levels. Um, <laughs> Instead of uh, solving uh, world hunger, I was working as a pot washer in my local pub. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of each shift, uh, the, the landlord was a complete tyrant, but he loved his beer, and he'd give us our wages, um, and he'd also give us a, uh, well, half a pint of, of local ale, and he'd talk us through the story behind it, and I was just utterly captivated. And um, it wasn't long before I started looking forward to the, to the beer more than the money. <laughs> but then what happened to most people, I think, happened to me. I finished school, I went to college, I went to university, I ended up on a pretty soul-destroying graduate job, thinking, God, what am I doing? Um, but throughout those years, um, I've been getting a lot of stick from mates, particularly the ones that were drinking snake bite in the student union. Um, for drinky old man beer and spending far too much time on geeky beer blogs, um, which was all true. Um, this was a time where, you know, only homeless people had beards. Uh, you... <laughs> I'm just bitter because I'm 29 and still can't grow one. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and the term craft beer wasn't, wasn't really over here yet. Um, uh, it, was, it was certainly being used in the States, but even then, but not by many people. Um, and something weird happened. It was about 2008, 2009, I'd just graduated. And um, all of a sudden, those mates that had been taking the mick out of me, they all just started caring a lot more where the things they bought came from, particularly food and drink, actually. And at first, I just put it down to them having a few more quid, growing up a bit. But actually, since I've realised that it wasn't just them, you know, this was the height of the banking crisis, and I think a lot of people realised that if they didn't start buying local from people they knew the names of, then our future would be taken out of our hands. And, of course, beer lent itself really well to that. So I walked into a pub with a mate one day, and he said, come on then, Matt, I want to drink better beer. Um, I want to drink less beer, but I want to drink better beer. I couldn't believe what he was saying, to be honest. And, <laughs> uh, and he said, where do I start? And I thought, God, I've been taking a piss out of me for years, but this is a wonderful opportunity. So, um, so I got him and I got a few friends and uh, I started holding beer tastings in a shed. Um, it's like your, you know, your standard um, sort of garden shed set up. Um, it's pretty simple. <laughs> Online business looks like prototype in a garden shed. You don't get that in Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and yeah, it's a pretty simple concept. I'd bring a load of bottled beers, talk people through the stories behind them, uh, give them a few tasting notes. Um, 
yeah, and it was a lot of fun. Um, it was great, actually, not launching a business on the internet, but in a shed. You know, a shed, uh, it, it, it wasn't fickle, uh, it wasn't noisy, I didn't have to do anything quickly. Um, but that's where uh, beer bods started, really. Um, but then the shed started getting busy, and I thought, if I could do what I'm doing in that shed on the internet, I could get a lot more people drinking better beer. And that was my... A lot of people ask, you know, where did you get the idea for beer bods? And I don't really believe in big ideas. Um, I believe in little ideas, and I believe uh, in, in just spotting things as and when they're happening. So certainly for beer bods, there wasn't a big idea. It was just how can we take this garden shed onto the internet and get a lot more people drinking better beer? Um, so I built... Uh, so I had this idea for an online beer club and subscription service. And um, I wrote a list of the things I needed to do to bring that business to life. It was a, it was a really long list. Um, you know, the standard things people tell you you need to launch a business. So, you know, you need to find a team, you need to get some investment, um, you need to find some premises, you need an alcohol license. Not getting one of those nearly got me into a lot of trouble. Um, <laughs> You know, you need people to do it with. And then the last thing on the list was uh, you need to find some customers, right? You know, no business survives without that. But that's usually what people get to last. And I thought, bollocks to it. I'll start with the last one. So I put a one-page website up that explained my idea for beer bods. Um, hopefully, you can all just about read that. And, um, and then I bottled it. I left it. Wherever you leave things on the internet that aren't published yet, I left it there. Um, <laughs> And then I came to the do lectures, uh, and it got to about the Friday night. And I was feeling like really powered up. I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit my job." And I, <laughs> I know my wife wants to get pregnant, and I, <laughs> I know I've got all these serious things to do. I know, like, we've just brought a house, but I'm gonna quit my job. You, you don't know what you've let yourself in for coming here, honestly. Um, and, uh, yeah, so this was about Friday night. So somehow I found some shonky internet in the canteen. And I went to this website and I pressed the big red button and it went live. Uh, and that was more exciting than it sounds, you know. To... <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden this was live on the internet. And, um, you know, when I, I thought, when I'll get back, I'll, you know, I'll tell people about my idea and I'll start building this thing. And it all happened slowly. And, you know, I'm in control of this thing. And then... Saturday lunchtime, a lovely chap called Richard, I think his business partner, Andy, is here. Um, he said to me, so what do you do? And I thought, rather than telling him the boring day job, I'd just tell him my idea as if it already existed. <laughs> so it's a, it's a great tip, by the way. People are always nice about ideas. If you tell it like it already exists, they'll either sign up or they won't. Well, he wanted to sign up, and I had my first customer. You know, shit, what do you do then? You know, um, and then... Even worse than that, he, he decided he was going to tweet about it. I thought nobody... Had, I thought nobody had, had internet at this place. <laughs> what are you doing? And then this guy called Christian comes up to me. He says, what do you do? And I told him again. And he was on this bloody podcast telling everyone, using things on the internet I still don't understand. So I... So, I get home from the do lectures, and what I told myself, if I get 100 people signing up to this website, I'm going to try and launch it as a business. I had 250 people sign up in 24 hours. Bloody hell. <laughs> so in September 2012, we, um, we launched. Um, I, I still don't know how. We've got some friends to... Uh, build us a website for nothing, rented some warehousing for nothing. Um, when you've got nothing but an idea and raw passion, you'll be amazed at what you'll get people to do for you. <laughs> okay. Um, so we had a good first year, but when your starting point is ground zero, um, you know, it's pretty hard not to. Um, only sort of good things can happen or it flops, and that's okay. You know, I was running it in my spare time. Um, but we, we got voted as the, uh, one of the 100 most innovative small businesses in the UK by some tin pot award thing. Uh, we, we got, we got uh, a Guardian journalist rang me up. I, I have no idea how she, how she heard about us, but um, she, she said, yeah, yeah, this sounds really interesting. I might do a write-up on this soon. Um, 
then two weeks before Father's Day, she published a thing uh, naming us as number one gift idea for Father's Day in The Guardian. We had no idea it was coming. It crashed the website straight away. <laughs> I certainly needed a beer after that. Um, but in the background, you know, it was one guy running a business in his spare time, uh, calling in a lot of favours. Um, it was, you know, we had no money. Um, I borrowed a credit card, uh, uh, two credit cards, which was £5,000, um, uh, about the same amount in savings. That completely wiped me out. Um, we still ran out of money twice. Um, and when I say ran out of money, this is the courier on the phone saying, we're not going to ship any more of your boxes until you pay us. So I'm on the phone on the other end saying, hello, dear. Um, you know that holiday we had booked? Um, you can imagine you know, the kind of stress that puts you under when you're starting something. And, and the stress that puts everybody who's around you and who's helping you. you know, it was immense. But whilst we were getting all these awards and these people saying nice things about us, that was happening in the background. So I think to, to start something, you need an idea and a bit of cheek. To scale something sustainably, you need loads more ideas, you need loads more cheek, uh, you also need more people and you need a lot more money. So we decided um, at that stage uh, to, um, to do some crowdfunding. Um, we had some uh, venture capitalists and private investors sniffing around us at that, at that stage. Um, but it just felt right to give the people who believed in beer bods from day one um, an opportunity to, to have a part of our business. So uh, we, uh, re we used uh, a website called Crowdcube and we raised £150,000 in 36 hours, which were, at the time was uh, a, a crowdfunding world record. It was the fastest funded business. Um, I, I had no idea what had just happened. Um, and again, you know, it was all just done on the fly. And all of that money uh, was from um, our existing subscribers. That felt like, that felt like the right way to grow. Um, so we had a few quid, we ha and then we were able to build a brilliant team. Um, Gordon's here running some workshops this weekend. Um, but our approach to growth hasn't changed one jot. Um, we still, uh, our biggest source of growth is our brilliant subscribers spreading the word for us. We know if we offer a really good service, if people believe in what we're doing, and we're really genuinely passionate about it, um, then they'll spread the word for us, and they do. Uh, and, and, and we've grown, like I said, to a few thousand subscribers in a couple of years. And that brings me on to what I think BeerBods is, is really about. Um, so we're a beer club and subscription service. We send our subscribers 12 beers in the post every 12 weeks. That's kind of the boring bit. That's what our, our competitors do too. Um, what I think makes BeerBods really special is um, a bit of clever logistics means all of our subscribers drink the same beer at the same time. So everyone goes online on a Thursday night to talk about that week's beer. Um, and we've built this amazing community of subscribers all over the UK, built on shared experience. Now, shared interest is one way of building an online community, but shared experience is completely different. When you've got a lot of people doing the same thing at the same time, with that shared interest as well, then then I think magic happens. And I'm kind of amazed that nobody else is really cottoning on to that online um, in the way that we have, in the way that we're really proud to do. BeerBods, secondly, I think, is about learning. Um, when we announce the Beer of the Week every Thursday, there's a, there's a link in the email to our website where they can read the story behind it. It's basically our way of doing what I was doing in the shed, giving people content about that beer so they can read the stories behind them, because that's when beer really comes to life. What I think is interesting about that is that when people understand what it is they're buying, I think that's when change can really happen from a consumerism point of view, particularly. And I think our customers, when they leave us, understand beer a whole lot better, and they're much likely to go and buy from somebody down the road who they know, know the name of, rather than some shite off a supermarket shelf. I promise I wouldn't swear, and I think I've had like four or five. Um, finally, BeerBuds is about discovery. 
Um, we joke with our customers that we'll send them a beer they don't like guaranteed. And that's kind of odd like, to say that to your customers. We're going to send you stuff you don't like. But we can also guarantee that you'll drink a lot of beer that you wouldn't have tried if it wasn't for us. And I think you know, the thing I'd like to encourage you is, like, in whatever you're doing, is just to be brave with your audience. You know, don't be afraid to upset them as long as you're, you know, you're willing to delight them as well. And that's certainly what we try and do. So that's kind of what we do and how we do it. But I really want to talk to you about why we do it. So I set up beer bods uh, to get more people drinking better beer. That's why we exist. End of. Brewing is, I honestly believe, it's the greatest British manufacturing story never told. There are 1,200 breweries in the UK. There's probably one within about 10 miles of where you live. There may be three or four within 10 miles of where you live. And they're all full of passionate, knowledgeable, talented staff who absolutely love what they do. And they're creating this amazing produce locally using just four ingredients, hops, water, yeast, and malt. And most of it is being drunk in your local pubs. And that brings me on to pubs. pubs are the heartbeat of every good community. But I defy you to find me a good pub with bad beer in it or a bad pub with good beer in it. The two are synonymous. So when we try and get people to drink better beer, we want them to eventually to go and drink it in a decent pub with friends. Pubs are one of the last social levellers. Where else do you get Lord of the Manor sat down next to... Uh, a farm worker drinking the same product that they've paid the same price for that they can both afford. You don't get that anywhere else now. Nobody goes to church anymore. <laughs> uh. This isn't a drink to invest in, put in a cellar and forget about it. Yet yeah, it has a diversity of flavour that lends itself to food matching in ways that no other drink can, in my opinion. I've drank 10% Imperial Porters with vanilla panna cottas that have been so good it's made me want to cry. <laughs> I've drank trad English bitters in pubs that the beer has been brewed on the same site of. I've drank trashy American cheap IPAs from, you know, cheap, like... You know, in terms of considering it's come from America, like next to Foster's, you know, it's, it's pretty cheap. Um, with deep fried naughtiness, uh, and it cuts through it in a way that just no other drink can. Uh, and I just, you know, whilst that all might sound um, a bit un, uh, unhealthy, I've got to flick through these because I've been forgetting to. Um, whilst that might all sound a bit unhealthy, um, Beer makes us at Beer Bods happy, and, and happiness is healthiness. Um, I honestly believe that beer reflects society. Um, that might sound a bit grand, but in just a few years, we've gone from a lot of people drinking a lot of rubbish beer made by massive, faceless corporations to drinking less beer but better beer brewed down the road by somebody we know the name of. And I think that's really exciting. People have been drinking beer for over 6,000 years. 6,000 years. And we've made a dent in that timeline. And we want to keep on making more dents. And we want to keep on getting more people drinking better beer. Thanks very much. <laughs>